morning, everyone. I'm glad that you're all out there watching, listening this morning. And uh, let me just say that in this series of messages that I'm preaching, End Time Matters, uh, it signals us to think that the Lord Jesus is coming back soon and very soon. And so uh, I like to sing songs about the cross and I like to sing songs about his return. Jesus is coming again. Whether we're ready or not, I pray that we'll all be ready. But I want to sing a song this morning that's entitled, We Shall Behold Him. I promise I'm going to sing it. Here it comes. This is an old Dottie Rambo song. The sky shall unfold, preparing his entrance. The stars will applaud him with thunders of praise. In his eyes shall enhance those waiting, and we shall behold him. Then face to face, we shall behold. shall be shout of his coming and the sleeping shall rise from their slumbering place and those who remain shall be changed in a moment Face to face, 
I want to uh, pray before we get started today, and just a before we pray, a reminder that on Tuesday night, there's a Zoom meeting we're going to have church-wide, and we're going to discuss our regathering, uh, the when of it and the how of it. So I invite you to please mark that on your calendar for Tuesday night this week, um, which I think will be the 4th, and we'll start at 6.30. Now, if you will, bow your heads with me wherever you are, and let's invite the Lord into our service this morning. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to you, Lord, for Jesus, the cross, and the blood. And Lord, this morning, once again, as we meet and as we ask every time we meet, would you open our hearts and mind this morning, Lord, that we might be able to hear a word from you. Maybe this, this morning, Lord, we'll see something in your word that perhaps we haven't seen before. And uh, Lord, more than just learning it and gathering information, Father, I pray this morning that you would help, it, help us to apply what we learn to our hearts, that we'll be different tomorrow for having been here, gathered together this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, today we're going to begin our uh, fourth sermon into this series on end times matter, and I've entitled the series... Um, or the message today is coronavirus and end time sign. Now, my ultimate goal in this series over the next couple of months is to give you what the Bible and what the Bible alone says regarding the unfolding of the end of days. Now, many are ready to give you their personal opinion. Some are quick to share multiple theories with you. Still others are going to provide views that are based on unreliable commentary and unsound reasoning. But you can be sure that I'm going to provide you with indisputable, uncontrovertible, uh, biblical truth, chapter and verse, to support what I deliver to you regarding what the Bible says about the end of days. So with that said, I want to address this issue that's uh, on every believer's heart, whether it's spoken or unspoken in these days. I want to talk about that, that uh, uh, question first today, since this pandemic is looming so large in our world and is constantly on our heart, on our minds. Uh, in fact, at the preaching of this message today, there are 17.8 million people around the world who've been infected and 685,000 people worldwide who have died from the virus. In America, there have been 4.7 million people infected and 157,000 have died from the virus. Now, in coming weeks, I intend to show you biblically how everything unfolds in our future chronologically. But today, the Lord has led me to start by addressing this COVID-19 virus, particularly the why of it, the timing of it, and, uh, and settle the question of it, is it an end time sign of the last days before Christ's return? A portion of what I'm going to share with you today came from uh, Mark Hitchcock in his new book called Corona Crisis. Dr. Hitchcock is a pastor and he's also a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. I've also used other sources from men I trust theologically, commentaries as well that use uh, Bible-centered exegesis and of course the Bible itself to give us answers as it always will if we'll just consult the Bible and trust the inerrant word of God. So my sermon today is a summation of that kind of research. Dr. Mark Hitchcock gave us an interesting way of looking at current events as they impact each of our future. And he says that in the world of television and feature film production, there's a tradition that's followed by the main crew once the um, primary final shots of the feature are done. And the main crew, as he uses this illustration, he says the main crew gathers and the director of the film recognizes each person by name. He then concludes that meeting by saying, that's a wrap. At, at that point, there's still much to be done before the film is ready for public consumption. There's still editing and uh, post-production uh, tasks to be completed. But the content is uh, in the can, as the producer says. 
And uh, yet the essential must-have elements remain to be added for the picture to be complete. Things like special effects and computer graphics and so on and so on. So recent events in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic have caused us to ask, are we approaching the end of the world? Are we approaching the time when Jesus is coming again? In other words, is everything in the can? And is it a wrap? More specifically, is this COVID-19 pandemic you realize pan means all, and demos is the word for people, pandemic, all people are going to be affected by it. But is this pandemic a sign of the end times? On one occasion, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees because they could tell the weather by certain signs that they saw, but they could not discern the signs of the time. And then in Matthew chapter 16, the Bible says, Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, Well, when it's evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the time. So before the question in the sermon title is answered, Perhaps it will be helpful to consider the whole subject of signs in the Bible. The Greek word for signs is the word simeon. It's also translated in other places as miracle or mark or, or token. And in this context, the word refers to something addressed to the senses that attest to the existence of divine power. And often, as in this case, that uh, uh, something... It's something in the future, and it's miraculous in nature. And uh, in various English translations, the word is sometimes called miracles, translated wonders. In many places in the Old and New Testament, signs is used in connection with signs, wonders, and miracles. Usually, uh, on occasion, you will see those three words together. So, a sign is a pointer that points to something beyond itself. In, uh, in traffic, for instance, we're guided by signs that tell us what's ahead, the, the speed limit, how many miles we have to go, uh, the cautions that we're to make notice of as we are driving. All of that's given to us by signs. Signs inside of buildings point to directions and locations, and uh, we're wise to carefully note the signs on the doors of the bathrooms to avoid embarrassing experiences that most of us have had. Amen? So sign is a pointer. And in the Bible, sign, signs point to a person, event, or an activity, some in the present, some in the future. So some of you out there who are watching, no doubt, wear contact lenses. Maybe you have one lens for distance and one for reading, and that allows you to see far and near, and the Bible is just like that. Sometimes the signs point to future realities or they might point to a near or present reality. Either way, they were miraculous signs of communication between heaven and earth, the visible and the invisible between God and man. So in a brief topical fashion, let's survey together some signs in the Bible. Number one, let's look at some past signs of the Old Testament. Um, Here's a, a, a few of those that are mentioned in the Old Testament. There are many more, but I've just pulled out a few. The word sign is first mentioned in Genesis chapter 1. The Bible says, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. So the lights in the firmament of the heaven are intended to be for signs, uh, so that we might know the seasons, we might know the, the, the days uh, and what year it is. God also gave a rainbow as a sign of his love. You remember? And he, he promised to never again destroy the earth with a flood. In Genesis chapter 9, the Bible says, And God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. The ten plagues of Egypt pointed to God's judgment upon Egypt. In Exodus chapter 4, at verse 8, the Bible says, Then it will be, if they do not believe you, nor heed the message of the first sign, that they may believe the message of the latter sign. So God instructed Moses to tell Pharaoh about the coming swarm of flies to 
plagued the, the nation of Egypt in Exodus chapter 8. And the Bible says there, I will make difference, make a difference between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall be. And again, they pointed to God's judgment, those signs, upon Egypt. And, and many are asking, is COVID-19 a judgment of God on a sinful world? Well, as of yet, I don't think we can say for sure. Perhaps it is, or, or at the least, maybe it's a wake-up call. Uh, often the Old Testament prophets pointed to disasters uh, as signs. And indeed, they themselves, the prophet themselves, were often signs uh, pointing to spiritual realities. Isaiah was, in, in chapter 20 of his letter, he said, Then the Lord said, Just as my servant Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot for three and a half, or for three years, and a sign and a wonder against Egypt and Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the prisoners, Egyptians as prisoners, and the Ethiopians as captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt and Ethiopia. And often uh, the prophets preaching um, the judgment that they preach, often that would get them killed. And listen, such announcements of biblical truth today are no more popular today than they were then either. Because people who choose to live in darkness are always uncomfortable with the light of biblical truth. Also, the feasts were signs that pointed to God's care for his people. As they left Egypt, the Israelites, and they journeyed through that wilderness. Listen to what the Bible says in Exodus chapter 31. Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout all generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. And uh, in verse 17, the Bible says there in Exodus 31, It's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. The feasts, all of them, were also signs that pointed to God's promise of a Savior that would be sacrificed for the sins of the world. Now that's a fascinating study we don't have time to get into today, but I encourage you to study those feasts in the Old Testament and look and see how they pointed to the coming Savior, Jesus. Secondly, uh, let's look at present and future signs in the New Testament. Uh, remember now, we're asking the question, is coronavirus a sign of the end times? The New Testament continues to use signs as pointers for us. Um, first of all, signs that point to Christ. Signs that point to Christ. Um, they pointed to his life and ministry. His birth was accompanied by signs. The place where he was born and the swaddling clothes that were wrapped around him pointed the shepherds to Jesus as the promised Messiah. Listen to what Luke chapter 2 says. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. That was the sign. His ministry was authenticated by signs. Look at John chapter 2. The Bible says, This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. John 20, verse 30 says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That means eternal life, but it also means an abundant life here and now. Secondly, they uh, pointed to his approval by God, these signs. Acts chapter 2 says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. On one occasion, the Jewish leaders demanded that Jesus show them a sign. And he replied, the only sign he would give them would be the sign of the prophet Jonah. In Matthew chapter 12, the Bible says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now what was the Lord referring to there? Well, Jonah's three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish was a sign pointing to the Lord's death, burial, 
and resurrection. Now, to a lesser degree, signs and wonders authenticated the ministry of the apostles as well. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Then let's look now at some present signs. Jesus concluded his ministry with the greatest sermon that has ever been preached on planet earth, the Sermon on the Mount. He was on the Mount of Olives. That's why it's called the Sermon on the Mount. It's recorded for us in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, in Mark chapter 13, and in Luke chapter 21. And in that astonishing sermon, Jesus gives the signs pointing to the end of the world and his coming back to earth. And the sermon is topical in nature, deals with the end of the world, deals with his return. It relates to the threefold division of humanity. And do you know what that threefold division of humanity is? Paul gave that division of humanity in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32, where he said, Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. So all humanity is divided into those three groups, Gentiles, Jews, and the church. And even though all scripture applies to all of us in some manner, in some way, scripture is always addressed to one of these three groups. So staying with the Olivet Discourse of our Lord in Matthew 24, I said the Sermon on the Mount, it is the greatest of all, but this is the Olivet Discourse and not part of the Sermon on the Mount. But it takes place in Matthew 24, and I want to show you some elements of that. Jesus speaks of the end times as they relate to the Gentiles, the Jews, and the church in those passages of Scripture that you see on your screen. And it's very important that we understand this division. So today, let's briefly deal with these signs our Lord gives in those first 14 verses of Matthew 24. The signs given in these Verses point to events that will ultimately transpire during the Great Tribulation. Their appearance today serves as pointers to that time that is coming. Thomas Campbell said, Coming events cast their shadows before them. There are two extremes to which people can go in interpreting these signs as they appear uh, at this stage in the, in the Word of God. First, there are those who make... Uh, everything a sign of the end. Mark Hitchcock said, I can remember when the appearance of large numbers of vultures in Israel and 666 on the Israeli car tags were called signs by some theologians. But listen, here's the truth. If everything is a sign, then nothing is a sign. Uh, the other extreme that uh, people go to is to just deny the signs altogether. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4 anticipates this. And Peter said, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come to the last days, walking according to their own lust, and saying, Where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Peter was saying that, yeah, there are scoffers, there are people out there who say, Well, the Lord hadn't returned yet, so he must not. Uh, be going to return. And we have people saying the same thing in our culture today. Vance Havner said, when people deny the signs, you've just seen another sign. Now to help us move toward the, the signs that may include COVID-19, I'm going to change the order somewhat. And I'm going to give you a brief presentation of, of these signs in that order. I think it'll, it'll make sense to you and you'll see why in just a few minutes. Uh, now, now, each one of these signs could be an, an entire message, as I said earlier, and I will spend more time in future sermons on some of these things. But if you will, get your Bibles out, open it to Matthew chapter 24. Some of this will be on the screen, uh, much of it will not be on the screen, but uh, briefly, I want to look at these things as we approach the end times. So, first of all, as we approach the end of the age, the end time, there's going to be, first of all, doctrinal signs. Doctrinal signs. Uh, false messiahs are predicted. Matthew 24, 5 says, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Verse 24 says, For false Christs 
and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. And uh, in the secular realm, in verse 5, we think about uh, men like uh, Hitler and, and Mussolini, uh, Stalin, men, men of their ilk. And in the religious realm that we read there in verse 24, we're told of false prophets who would show great signs and wonders. And, and, and the tragedy of uh, Jim Jones leading his followers to suicide still prominent in my mind today. Uh, who could forget the pictures of all those tubs of cyanide and corpses laying out there dead everywhere? The, the, the fiery death, you remember also, of David Koresh's disciples. How can we ever forget that picture? They, they, uh, they each, as so many others through the centuries have done, but these people claim to be the Messiah, the leaders of these cults. Scripture warns us that there's also going to be a falling away from the faith. 1 Timothy chapter 4 says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart, depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy. I'm going to come back to that word in a little bit. I want you to pay attention to it, hypocrisy. Having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Look at verses 3 and 4 of 2 Timothy 3. People will be in the last days, in the end of days. They'll be unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And this is going to trigger the rapture. This is what the world's going to be like. This is how the people are going to be like before the rapture. It'll trigger the rapture, which is the end of the current age of grace that we're in now. And it is the beginning of of the tribulation and will be the, uh, showing the appearance of the Antichrist who is going to perform powers and signs and lying wonders. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The Bible says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the workings of Satan with all power, signs, lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And, and for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. What lie is Paul talking about there? Well, he's talking about the lie of the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to say that he is the Savior. He is the Messiah. He is the one who can bring everybody back from the, the edge of uh, eternity. And for this reason, it says, God sends them that strong delusion to believe the lie that they may all, listen now, that they may all be condemned who did not believe the truth and had pleasure in unrighteousness. My friend, let me tell you, if you may know the story and you know the tribulation is coming, but you're not ready to turn from your darkness to the light of Jesus Christ, don't you think for one moment that you're going to have a chance when the tribulation starts to be able to receive Christ because God himself is going to send you a strong delusion that you believe the lie. Why? Because you initially, when you had the chance, uh, would not believe the truth and uh, believe that Jesus was the Messiah and receive him as your Lord and Savior. So there's going to be doctrinal signs. And then there's also going to be international signs. Jesus said there's going to be war. There's going to be rumors of war. But the end is not yet. Now, there have always been uh, wars, uh, according to what we read there on the screen in Matthew 6 and Matthew 14. Always been wars. However, listen, in the last days, it's going to be different. We now, where we are today because of technology, we have the possibility today, some say the probability, but we have the possibility of global total war, even mutual annihilation. Wars anywhere on the earth today can be watched by satellite television. So not a single war, but every war will be a part of this prophecy here in Matthew 24, verse 6 and 14. Um, I'm going to just mention also that the return of Israel to their land in 1948 is a key part of the... Um, in time international signs. A further part of the international signs is the preaching of the gospel to the whole world in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14 there on your screen. 
Actually, this sign is going to be completely fulfilled during the great tribulation. Won't be completely fulfilled until then, the tribulation. The two witnesses in Revelation 7, uh, perhaps Moses and Elijah, uh, the Bible does not say who those two witnesses are, but those two witnesses, the Bible does say, is going to be uh, witnesses to Christ. They're going to be preaching the gospel. And as a result of their preaching, these two witnesses preaching, 144,000 Jews are going to be converted as a result of that. Then they are going to become evangelists who are going to preach the gospel to the world. Now we're talking about during the tribulation period in Revelation 7, 1 through 8. Uh, and, and as a result of their preaching, the 144,000 who were saved as a result of the two witnesses, but as a result of the 144,000, the Bible says a great multitude which no man can number will be converted in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. Also, the gospel will be preached all over the earth by an angel of the Lord. And that's according to Revelation chapter 14. It says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every tribe, nation, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear not, give, gl give glory to, to him, for the hour of his judgment is coming. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And so you have the two, you have the two witnesses. And then you have the 144,000 preaching the gospel all over the planet. And then, just to be sure, God sends an angel from one corner of the earth to the other to share the gospel because it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But uh, we, do, we need to do all that we can right now to get the gospel to the whole world during this age of grace. We don't want them to have to work too hard in the great tribulation. Eh? Well, I say that tongue in cheek uh, because they are going to work hard preaching the gospel. But our marching orders, listen, just because this is going to happen in the tribulation and everyone will eventually hear the gospel, our marching orders are still to proclaim and announce and broadcast to everyone on earth the great gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you this, we're supposed to do it because we're commanded to do it, but when you lead someone to Christ, I want to tell you, there is no better medicine for your spirit than to see someone bow their heart, bow their knee, and say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the great gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that we are to share and that's going to be shared during the tribulation period. Apparently we don't accomplish, that is what I'm saying, uh, getting the gospel all over the world uh, by the time the rapture gets, gets here. We don't get it all accomplished because the two witnesses, the 144,000, and then the angel are going to continue to spread the gospel to people who haven't heard it. But nonetheless, it's still our main goal, our objective, our marching orders, and, and the Lord's great commission to all believers. You ought, to, you ought to make it a point. If you're alone with someone for just a minute, five minutes, that to me is a divine appointment to tell them about Jesus, to ask about their spiritual condition. Next, we're going to see moral signs, moral signs. Matthew 24 says uh, iniquity or lawlessness, which is sin, lawlessness, um, shall abound. Um, is that happening today, right now? Is that happening? Yes. We can take that word lawlessness. Now, in the Bible, that's also translated as sin. It's the same word. It means sin, lawlessness. But I'm telling you, you start telling everyone that what you're seeing on your television, when people begin to burn down buildings and they begin to um, blind police officers with lasers or when they fight back against authority uh, to the damage and hurt of property and people, I want to tell you that is lawlessness. But who on television do you hear today saying that lawlessness is sin? Would you love for somebody to stand up in Congress and say that? Our problem today is not that we need new legislation or more education. Our problem is that we need transformation that only the Lord Jesus Christ can bring. And we need to stop all of this other stuff and start loving people to the cross and getting them saved, that's the only way their hearts are going to be changed. So we see these moral signs. One of the moral signs that we all grieve over is abortion. Since Roe versus Wade in 1973, 
Uh, there have been over 60 million abortions in America. You know, I look at that and I think, well, it's too bad the babies didn't get the right to choose like the woman has the right to choose. And let me tell you what they've been given the right to choose. They've been given the right to choose murder, death. And then they're choosing abortion as a means of birth control. The choice should have come before you laid down and allowed your body to become a plaything for someone who probably never cared about you in the first place. Also, listen, perverted lifestyles like the LBGTQ crowd, they're not only accepted, but they're approved and they're adopted today. What used to slink down the back alleys of society now proudly marches on the main streets of America. And, 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 and even seeking high office, the presidency, and standing behind church pulpits. What a slap in the face of holy God. What a slap in the face of righteousness. It's time we stop being intimidated by the ungodly crowd and quit calling evil good and call it by what it is. It's sin. Sin, sin. And uh, we need to help these perverted and deceived souls find forgiveness and reconciliation with God and life transformation at the cross of Jesus where they're going to find that love, that help, that hope in, in the one and only in the one who died for their sins. But it seems the church today is only, we've only got two stands um, uh, on this subject of homosexuality. One is to agree with them and accept them or, 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 the, or the other one is to vehemently disagree hatefully reject them. May, may I suggest something else? I suggest that this is what we should be doing. We should share the gospel with them in love and compassion, and in that alone will they find healing and love and purpose and transformation like they've never known before, and the courage and strength to walk away from the shackles of that lifestyle into a life of meaning and purpose in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there are devotional signs, devotional signs. Matthew 24, 12, the, the love of many shall grow cold. The love of many shall grow cold. Too many churches today are characterized by too little commitment and too much coldness and worldliness. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Hello? But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up themselves for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Folks, that's what's happening right in front of us today, if you didn't already recognize it. But people are leaving the truth. People don't want to hear the truth. They want to go and hear someone who's going to tickle their ears and uh, allow them to continue on in their sin. Well, I want to tell you, there's going to come a day of reckoning for that preacher and that teacher and that person in the pew who wants to keep their own sinful lifestyle and still feel good about themselves because they worship, they said, they worship God. We're witnessing right before us, I'm saying today, the apostate Laodicean church predicted in Revelation chapter 3. The Bible says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says, says the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, that's the Lord, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I'm talking about today the church who's going to be here during the tribulation period. You said, preacher, there's going to be a church here during the tribulation period? Absolutely, there's going to be a church. There will be many who are worshiping after the rapture takes place and during the tribulation period. Period. You know why? Because they know they missed the rapture. Oh, I wish I could bring some more out of that. I don't have time. Number five, there's going to be uh, technical and intellectual signs. Now, now, I'm taking this from Daniel chapter 12. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. There shall be some time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even at that time and at that time your people shall be delivered everyone who is found written in the book he's talking about the book of life and that you get your name written in the lamb's book of life when you become a believer when you sell out to Jesus Christ and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life some to shame and everlasting contempt those who are wise shall shine 
like the brightness of their firmament and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, listen, listen. But listen, you, Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book, close it until the end, uh, until the time of the end when many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. And some translations say when travel and knowledge will increase. Seal the book up, Daniel. Nobody's going to understand it. Nobody's going to really believe it. Nobody's going to see what you're saying and understand what you're saying until the end of the age when knowledge and travel is going to increase. And though it's not included in the, the list that Jesus gives, I took it out of Daniel, we can readily, easily see that the current advances in technology, the vast, the vast uh, accumulations of knowledge are signs pointing to the prediction and the fulfillment of what Daniel said, what he predicted. Number six, there's going to be physical signs, physical signs. In verse seven, now, now Jesus mentions three physical signs, so uh, I'm going to rearrange them also, okay? First, he mentions famines. Did you know that 300,000 people starve to death every day, and many of those are children? The, the United Nations warns that famines of biblical proportions are ahead of us in our future. The UN is warning of that even now. Armies of locusts have devastated parts of Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. And in the midst of the, the, the COVID-19, Costco and Tyson Foods have announced meat shortages. One third of Wendy's stores have stopped selling burgers. And sadly, polls are being done more and more and more, and Americans are saying that they're going to bed hungry at night. Now, if that don't grieve you, bad enough that it's happening all over the world, but when we begin to see our own nation hungering like that, we should grieve all the more. So this sign points to Revelation 6, 8, where hunger follows in the wake of the pale horse. What is the pale horse? The pale horse in Revelation represents death. And we see that happening on a smaller scale, that it's going to happen in the tribulation, but it's happening nonetheless today. Perhaps a precursor of what is coming soon. Hunger is following death around the globe. Second, Jesus also mentions earthquakes. The incidence of earthquakes has risen dramatically. Earthquakes will occur in many places, the Bible says. In, in America, the city's most susceptible to earthquakes are Los Angeles, San Francisco, Salt Lake City, and Memphis. There's even a fault that runs up and down the eastern seaboard. Recently, San Diego was rocked by a 4.5 quake. Chattanooga was hit by a 3.3 and a 4.3 follow-up. Scientists warned that it's just a matter of time before the big one hits on the San Andreas Fault. And that's going to cause large portions of Southern California to fall into the sea, fall way below sea level. And so all of these are signs, pointers to the earthquakes that are mentioned in Revelation. Now thirdly, and, and of particular interest, it ought to be to all of us, is our Lord's mention of pestilences. Pestilences. The word is a, is a reference to epidemics and pandemics of disease. Pestilence is not something that's new to our day. It's not unique to our day. But consider, we've really only experienced just two pandemics in the last two centuries. In 1918, the Spanish flu seized the whole world. One third of the whole human race was infected, and between 50 and 100 million people died globally from that Spanish flu. I recently looked at a picture of fans watching a Georgia Tech football game during the, those years, and, and they all had on masks in, in, in 1918. Isn't that something? And in 1968 and 69, the world was gripped by the Hong Kong flu. wasn't considered a pandemic, uh, but worldwide, 2 million people died in many countries. And during that time, can you imagine, the Woodstock Rock Festival was held in New York, where they say it was over a half a million people present. But it's amazing to me, with all of the disease going on then, that there were no such severe measures taken then like we're witnessing today in light of COVID-19. Today, life as we have known it has been turned upside down. And the best we can tell, listen, it started with one person in Wuhan, China. 
and to date it has spread to 190 of 192 countries in the world. And as I said at the beginning of this ser uh, sermon, nearly 18 million people worldwide have been infected, 685,000 worldwide have died. In America, 4.7 million uh, people infected, 157,000 died from the virus. So, again, is COVID-19 a sign of the end times? Well, the answer is both no and yes. No in the sense that it's not a sign in and of itself that we read about that's spoken of in Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, or in Revelation. But yes, it is a part of an end time sign that is uh, pointing to the end, defining the beginning of sorrows that Jesus spoke about. Actually, let me tell you something worse, if I can. Every person on the planet is infected with a deadlier pestilence than COVID-19, a deadlier disease, and that disease is sin. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sin also is an invisible enemy. Though inward it has symptoms that weaken us, separate us from one another, and eventually results in death, there's still no human vaccine, nor will there ever be a human vaccine for sin. But beloved, listen to me. Here's the good news. God has provided a cure for the sin pandemic. Christ died on the cross to pay the price for our sins. 1 John 2, verse 2 teaches that Jesus made the atoning sacrifice for the whole world. Listen to what it says. And he himself is the propitiation. That means satisfaction for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. That's a fascinating word, propitiation. Uh, that Jesus is our pro propitiation. That means that God was satisfied with the sacrifice that Jesus made when he gave himself for us and took our sins on his own shoulders, on his own body, as he was strapped to that cross, nailed to that cross. He died for the sins of the world. God was satisfied with that, and that alone is how we can uh, be saved and, and be in heaven for all eternity. And that alone is the only way that can happen. Through faith in him, the whole world could be forgiven and cured of their sin pandemic. Final sign. Um, in Matthew 28, uh, all these are the beginnings of sorrows. The beginning of sorrows. There we go. Um, there's another sign that points to the end time and the return of the Lord. Now, we, we call it, we use this word, convergence. Convergence. All of these are the beginning of sorrow. All these things. In, in reviewing all the previous signs, it's apparent that each has been a part of mankind's experience. All the days since Jesus listed them, all of these things have taken place, right? We'll all agree with that. There have been earthquakes. There have been pestilences. There have been famines. All the things, all of that has been taking place since Jesus said this nearly 2,000 years ago. And, uh, and in verse 6, he said, for all these things must come to pass, but the, the end is not yet. And then Jesus says here in verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrow. W.A. Criswell said, these conditions will be accentuated at the time of the end. The word translated sorrows in the King James means the birth pains of a woman who's delivering a child. And we know these pains increase in frequency and intensity as the time of birth draws near. And uh, though no occurrence of any one sign in and of itself is a sign that the end is near, Still, the convergence of all of them in frequency and intensity lets us know that the time is near. Let me explain it kind of like this. When I was a little boy, our family would go to Florida on occasion uh, to visit family, sometimes to Jacksonville, other times we went to Miami. And all along the route, there were signs giving us directions, and sometimes those signs giving directions were miles apart. But as we approached, our destination. As we got closer and closer to our destination, the signs became more numerous and the signs became more specific, very specific. Well, listen, 
God has posted signs that let us know where we are today and where we're going. W.A. Criswell gives another helpful explanation uh, concerning these converging signs. He says they are, uh, these converging signs are the characteristics of the entire present age until Christ returns. The conditions depicted here have marked all the centuries since the Lord in his resurrected body ascended to glory. But it's the convergence, don't you see? As Criswell said, the convergence, which is the final sign. Now, let me just share a couple other things with you about signs. There's still more signs to come in our future. If you go to Revelation 1, 1, uh, it's where John said there that the message he was given, uh, that he was writing down, as the Lord instructed him to, uh, was sent and signified. And when you look at that word signified, that's the verb form of the Greek noun uh, translated sign. You could pronounce the word signified if you wanted to. And so this indicates that the whole book of Revelation is uh, written in signs that point to how there will be a rap one day on human history. And Dr. Hitchcock tells about a man who was visiting the upper peninsula of Michigan with a friend. And he was so stunned by the beauty uh, where he stood. And he said, man, this looks like the end of the world. And uh, the friend said, no, it's not the end of the world, but I think you can see it from here. So listen, the, the signs we witness today, this is what I'm saying. The signs we're witnessing today help us see the rap that's coming. The revelation is filled with signs that teach us how, how human history is going to conclude. We don't have to guess at it. We don't have to result to, uh, to going to psychics. We don't have to look at people who claim they know the future on TV and are right maybe 40% of the time. I can be right 40% of the time about anything, can't you? Well, we don't have to do that because the Bible gives us an exact unfolding of human history exactly as it's going to conclude. And I'm going to summarize it like this. Some of the signs point to the final plan, the signs of the four horsemen of the apocalypse in Revelation chapter 6. That constitutes somewhat of a parallel to the signs that Jesus listed in Matthew 24. I love it when the Bible does things like that. If you look in Revelation 6 and what Jesus said in Matthew 24, and there's such similarities there. For instance, the fourth, the fourth horse uh, the pale horse in verse 8 of Revelation 6 is, is uh, particularly interesting and has parallels to our Lord's prediction concerning pestilences that we saw in Matthew chapter 24 and, uh, and verse 7. Pale in that verse there in Revelation refers to a sickly green color. The Greek word that's used there is the word klomos. And we get our word chlorine and chlorophyll from that word. So the rider on the pale horse is called death. That's another interesting word. In this context, it means death as a result of a disease. Did you hear that? Look it up yourself. In context, it means death as the result of a disease. And in the Old Testament, it was used for leprosy, that disease. But this fourth scene brings a judgment of God resulting in the death of one-fourth of the earth's population. You see it on your screen. Now, on the basis of today's population, that would be over 1.5 billion people. Some will die of hunger, uh, which parallels what Jesus said about famine in Matthew 24, 7. Another word speaks to us there. John mentions that the beasts of the earth also will contribute to deaths. Now, what is that all about? So, I'm asking you this. Think about it. Is scripture indicating that the death by disease here could be that, the, that disease that's transferred from animals to humans? You say, what are you talking about, preacher? Well, there seems to be evidence that COVID-19 was transferred to a citizen of Wuhan, China from bats, from bats. And we do know that Ebola in 1976, SARS in 2003 came from bats. It's been estimated, estimated that 75% of all new diseases cross from animals to humans. Now the word beast there in Revelation 6-8 is really in a, uh, the, um, the diminutive form in the Greek language. So it could be translated little beast. That's what it would mean to be diminutive. Little beasts. Could it be rats that are spoken of there? Some theologians have suggested that the death in Revelation 6-8 comes about because of rats. Recent articles have been written and printed saying that rats are becoming desperate for food. They're becoming very aggressive. In fact, rats have killed more people than the wars, all the wars in history. They carry as many. One rat carries over 35 diseases, sometimes more than that. 
and fleas on the rats in the 14th century is what carried the bubonic plague that killed 200 million people in five years. What a frightening, listen, here's where it comes together, the convergence. What a frightening prospect all of that is for those who are going to be left behind. Left behind at the rapture to face those plagues and pestilences of the great tribulation. That's what's being spoken of in the book of Revelation there. And then again, Jesus mentioned earthquakes in Matthew 24. In Revelation, there are five earthquakes mentioned, and two of them are called great earthquakes. And these earthquakes are part of God's final plan for the world. An earthquake, don't you know, it shakes the most substantial reality and real estate that we know. And, and the foundation of man's world and soul are going to be shaken in those final days. Now let me close and let's, let me talk briefly about the final plagues. Sometimes the mention of plagues includes pestilence, but not every time. In Revelation 15, 1, the final plagues are unfolded in which we see a final manifestation of the, the wrath of God. And, and, and just so we're clear, understand this, the rapture has occurred, true believers to the Lord have been taken out of the way, and then God's wrath is poured out on earth for seven years. It's as though God is saying, I've done all I know to do. I gave you my son who died in your place. All you have to do is receive him. There's nothing that you can do on your own. But you still reject it. You still live in unrighteousness and darkness. So you want hell in your life? I'm going to give you hell for seven years. That's what the Lord is effectively saying. And then during the tribulation, God pours out that holy wrath. Jess Henley said, wrath is God's settled hostility against sin. Once and for all, God's going to settle his hostility against sin. And listen to me, I would be a, a, a remiss if I said, didn't say, God loves sinners, but he hates the sin that brings them such sorrow and heartache and death. The final players, beginning in Revelation 12, God reveals signs that picture final players. There's a sign from heaven. John calls it a great wonder in verse 1. Translation is the noun for sign, and clearly it's the sign of the nation of Israel. There's also a sign from hell. In Revelation 3, um, um, uh, Revelation 12, verse 3, another wonder or sign is the red dragon. Clearly it points to, to, uh, to Satan. It points to, to uh, Satan. I'm on the right place, yes. Uh, in Revelation 13, the one who does great wonders and performs those miracles is the false prophet. In Revelation chapter 16, um, uh, verses 13 and 14 continues the signs by referring to unclean spirits like frogs, which point to Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, the unholy trinity. And, and, and notice this regarding the unholy trinity. Frogs are used there as the example. And listen, what are frogs? Frogs are uh, cold-blooded amphibians. There's poison in their skin, and they have the ability to change color. That's a perfect example and sign for what some call the satanic trinity. Mark Hitchcock says they are, they are pictured as performing miracles or signs that deceive the kings of the earth by dangling dreams of dazzling victory against the Lord Jesus, but instead sending them to their defeat at the battle of Armageddon. That's what they do, this unholy trinity. They gather the people of the earth and say, oh, we can take him. We can beat that Lord Jesus Christ. And they all assemble to do that at the battle of Armageddon. Now, that battle that's recorded in Revelation 19, I want to tell you, it's not much of a war, not much of a battle. The Lord Jesus is going to return with his saints. That's us. That's me and you. Woo! We're coming back with him on a white horse, and he's coming down. And, but you know what? We're not going to do a thing. We're not going to do a thing. Jesus is going to return and win the victory with what? A word. Just a word in verse 15. In, in, in his earthly ministry, Jesus spoke a word, and a fig tree withered away. Jesus spoke a word, just a word from him, and howling winds and heaving waves and storm clouds vanished. Jesus spoke to legions of demons, and they instantly fled. And now he speaks a word, and the battle of Armageddon is over. And there's the final picture that mentions signs that I wanted to show you. Revelation 19, 20, the false prophet who wrought miracles is, is thrown into the lake of fire. This blasphemous a loudmouth false prophet is stricken in place, and we're going to say good goodbye to that miracle-working windbag. And at that point, there's going to be no more signs. 
all the events and the signs uh, that have pointed to this, all will come to pass and will cease. So what's the point of all the signs? Is it to cause you to be living in fear? No, not at all. Jesus said just the opposite in Matthew 24, 6. Be not troubled. The signs are not intended to scare us. The signs are intended to prepare us. When all the events represented by the signs are, are in the can, uh, God's going to say it's a wrap. Luke 21, 28. When these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draws near. During these trying and uh, unparalleled days in which we live, Vance Havner, I think, had some good counsel for us. He said, don't drop your heads in discouragement. Don't shake your heads in despair, but lift your heads in delight. Let me end with this illustration, and I promise this is the end. I want to drive my point home with this illustration. Please listen. In 1980, the Mount St. Helens volcano erupted. Geologists had predicted it. They said it was coming, and sooner than later was it going to come. Gray steam uh, plumes belched hundreds of feet in the air. Loudspeakers on patrol cars blared warnings to the people. Radio and TV stations were sounding out the alarm. Warnings were everywhere. The signs of warning were everywhere. And people left. They fled for their lives. But not old Harry Truman. I'm not talking about the president now, but just another man whose name was Harry Truman. This 83-year-old man, caretaker of Mount St. Helens Lodge, he refused to budge. He ignored the warning signs, and he even proudly declared, I quote, Nobody knows more about this mountain than old Harry, and it don't dare blow up on him. Well, on May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted, and the flowing lava flattened and burned everything for 150 miles. Harry Truman was never seen again. And why? Because he ignored the signs. Listen, Jesus has given us the signs. If you ignore those signs, you are going to be, the Bible says, separated from God for eternity in a place that God never intended you to be that was prepared for Satan and his demon horde. Now I'm talking about a place called hell where the Bible says the fire burns forever but never, never consumes. My friend, I pray that you let Jesus point you to those signs and if you ask, listen, he will save anyone who will ask of him. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, you have clearly laid out before us, Lord, how things are going to unfold in the end days. But Lord, there are some who will deny it, some who will pay no attention to it, some, Lord, who are going to step out into eternity on their own merits, which is not going to be good enough. No matter how good we may be or righteous we may think we are, we're not righteous at all. In fact, your word tells us that we are like filthy rags as we are compared to your holiness. And Lord, the only thing that's going to fix us is Jesus Christ. I know it's not popular today, Lord, but it is the truth. There is no other way to be saved, to go to heaven, unless we go through the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray today, Father, that you would help those who have been listening this morning to see these warning signs. They're coming, and they're beginning to converge now. And, Lord, we believe with all of our heart, according to the Scriptures, that it won't be long before you rapture the believers home, and then seven years later, after the awful hell on earth for those left behind, you're going to return and do battle once for all with evil to destroy it forever. And God, I would pray that anyone within the sound of my voice this morning would say yes to Jesus Christ, say no to the world, and be saved this morning. In Christ's name I pray, amen.
And my invitation to you today is that wherever you may be, wherever you're watching from, if you're listening in your car, maybe you're not sure that if you were to die tonight, you'd go to heaven. Maybe you couldn't answer the question if you stood before God after your death and he said, why should I let you into my heaven? You wouldn't know what to say. This morning, I want to tell you what you can do. You can bow your head, or if you're driving, you can say a prayer right in your car. And listen to me. You can ask the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you, and he will forgive you. Your sins will be forgiven. And the importance of that is, listen, you can't get to heaven without God's forgiveness. We have to ask him. It's not automatic. I pray that you'll do that today. Be saved. Mark it down. Be sure that you know, not on any of your own merits, not on anything that you have done or who you are, that you're going to go to heaven, though, only because Jesus Christ died in your place and you have received that free gift of eternal life, according to Romans 6, 23. Will you do that today? If you do make a decision, would you please today give us a call here at the office? I'd like to know, and I have some information that I'd like to give to you. Our number here is 843-797-2982. Or you can text or call me personally. My number, my cell number is 843-670-7255. The most important decision that you will ever make in your life is what will I do with Jesus? And there's no middle of the road, no sitting on the fence. Jesus said, either you're with me or you're against me. There's no time to say, well, I want to think it over. You need to make a decision today. The Bible says we're not promised tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. Well, God bless you. I'm glad you were here with me today. And if not before, I'll see you Tuesday night on our Zoom meeting and then again on Thursday night for our midweek Bible study. God bless you. Have a great afternoon with your family.